Um, we are going to try and be good neighbors to um, the surrounding businesses. So you may have seen some no parking this morning. And while that is public parking, um, it, I think it's the least we can do is allow their customers and patients and clients to park in front of their building. So thank you for, um, for being good neighbors when it comes to parking. This morning, I'm super excited because I've been talking about things like Tabor and Gallagher and Amendment 23 is really exciting, um, but Colorado fiscal <laughs> policy. And so um, from the Building a Better Colorado organization, this morning we were welcoming Reeves Brown, who's going to facilitate the conversation around some fiscal policy questions um, in the state. This is not around a ballot issue per se this fall. These are the larger pictures of really wrapping your head around um, what Tabor and, and Gallagher and Amendment 23, and I don't think we're covering Amendment 23 necessarily no. this morning, which is um, public school funding, so that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, what those issues look like and what they mean and really what your opinions are. So Reeves was formerly the director of DOLA, the Department of Local Affairs, which is uh, a cabinet level position. He worked with Governor Hickenlooper, and that um, is a great agency, you might not know it, but DOLA is very supportive of local communities across the state, and they also are responsible for a lot of grant dollars that come to us. So I always feel personally really excited um, when Dole is around because their their money makes things happen in communities across the state. <laughs> and um, formerly, before he was with Dola, he was the director of Club 20, which is the organization that represents 22 counties on the western slope at the state level for advocacy. So he's he's one of us. He may live in Denver now, but he is a western slope guy in his heart. Um, let's give Reeves Brown a big round of applause. Trade for this one versus holding that one. This is the fancy new mic that. How about that? Is that better? Yeah. Okay, better? So okay, if if you can't hear, if I if I'm not talking into it, just wave your hand or whatever. So thank you very much for inviting me uh, to, to address this group, and uh, thank you for what you do in this community. I, I, I asked Barbara, I said, so does the forum meet monthly? She said, no, weekly. I said, you get people to show up weekly to talk about mundane issues like state fiscal policy? So thank you very much for your engagement. Uh, uh, we're going to cover a bunch of material here in a short amount of time and over the next hour. So I'm going to go kind of quickly. Those clickers, everybody should have a clicker. You don't need to turn it on. Don't do anything with it until I tell you to. Don't push any buttons. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll get to those in a minute. Uh, so let me just explain a little bit about who Building Better Colorado is. Uh, Building Better Colorado is a nonprofit, non advocacy group that was formed in 2015 by a group of uh, statewide civic leaders across the political spectrum who shared a, uh, a frustration, a collective frustration in the increasing inability of our traditional political process to bring people together, uh, to work together for common sense solutions, uh, and, and uh, a shared belief that the pathway really to building a, a, a course, charting a course for a better Colorado lies in identifying thought leaders in communities around the state and engaging them in a constructive conversation about where we are today and, and empowering them to kind of drive the outcome of where they want to see Colorado go. Uh, to, to see if we can to find any consensus along that line. And people understandably want to know who's behind the curtain. You know, if you follow the money, you'll find the agenda. And we're, we're no different. Come on in. Uh, there are, grab a clicker there, uh, if you don't mind. There, oh. So, uh, so uh, we are very blessed to have uh, generous support of a number of statewide foundations that uh, like us, our 501c3 entities, they don't have a policy dog in this fight. They simply, like us, want to uh, see an honest conversation amongst Colorado thought leaders about what we want our state to be and where we want to go. Uh, so we started this effort in 2015. It was a uh, really just an experiment. It was supposed to be a six-month uh, project. Uh, and it was based on our belief that in every community, large or small, rural, big city, county, doesn't matter, in every community there are certain individuals that wield disproportionate influence because of their name or their title or their resources or their social media Rolodex or whatever. 
And our experiment was to see, could we find a methodical, fair way to go into any community and identify who are those people that really move public opinion? And if you could identify them, could you, could you get them to engage for a couple hours in a constructive conversation about state policy? And, and if you could, if they truly represented the diversity of a community, would they agree on anything? And if they did agree on anything, would the agreement of a group of civic leaders in one community look anything like the agreement of a group of civic leaders in a very different looking community? And so we, uh, we hosted uh, 30 meetings uh, in, uh, in 2015, 30 communities around the state. Uh, one in Montrose. Uh, we engaged about 10,000 Coloradans through those meetings and a parallel online conversation. We talked about three different issues. We talked about how we amend our state constitution, how we participate in elections. We talked about the state revenue limit. We looked at about 60 different policy ideas. We empowered our audiences to use these clickers to kind of determine if they thought we should do anything different and if so, what that should be. Uh, and out of that statewide conversation, there were five consensus policy recommendations that emerged, which was about five more than we thought we would see agreement on. Um, and we published our report in February of 2016 and we were done, or so we thought. Uh, subsequent to our efforts, there were two separate independent campaigns that stood up and took three of those five ideas to your ballot in 2016. Uh, majority of you voted for those. They're all three uh, policies now. Uh, the legislature took a fourth of those ideas uh, up in the 2017 session and adopted that. And that kind of put wind in our sails. So maybe there's something to this of really targeting uh, thought leaders in communities and really empowering them uh, to determine the pathway forward to see if there's any consensus. So we're, we did that again this year. In 2019, we were in 37 communities, uh, including Montrose again. We engaged about 1,800 community leaders in those communities. Uh, and then several thousand in this parallel online conversation. We had 111 meetings through that process, a little over 20,000 miles. Uh, we had two breakdowns. We lost a tire on the top of Vail Pass and an alternator on Wadsworth Boulevard. Uh, so it was, it, was a, uh, it was a lot of fun. It's the best, you know, I was talking to somebody last night, a friend of mine in Junction, that he said, man, you put on a lot of miles. And I said, yeah, but can you think of a better state to put miles on? I mean, it's just, we take for granted the state we live in. But So the, the conversation was obviously population proportionate along the front range, but trying to provide an opportunity for everybody in the state to participate uh, in this conversation. Um, and in our 2019 conversation, as Barbara said, we, we focused on state fiscal policy, and we talked about the three uh, fiscal constitutional amendments that we have adopted uh, and embedded into our constitution over the last 35 years. Uh, we actually have four uh, constitutional policies in our state constitution. The first one was uh, in 1876 at statehood, and that was the balanced budget requirement. Uh, some people have suggested we should have stopped there, uh, but we didn't <laughs> stop there. Uh, in 1982, we adopted the Gallagher Amendment to our state constitution, which froze the ratio of the total value of, of residential property in the state to the total value of non-residential property, and that's affecting the property tax base that funds all local services. Ten years after that, we adopted the Tabor Amendment, which uh, requires a vote of the people to raise taxes and places a limit on the amount of uh, revenue that state and local governments can collect and invest in public service and infrastructure. And then eight years after that, we adopted Amendment 23, which is a minimum funding mandate for K-12. And the reason we're talking about these three policies in our 2019 statewide conversation is that uh, they are the three fiscal policies that you've put into your constitution over the last 35 years. Uh, and they affect your quality of life, uh, however you define your quality of life, whether it's you know, how much time you spend with your family versus commuting to and from work, or the quality of your kid's K-12 education, or ability of your kid to go to college, or the quality of your next doctor, or the amount of money left in your pocket after your taxes. However you define your quality of life, these three fiscal formulas that you put in your constitution affect it. And if you don't like how they're affecting your quality of life, uh, then you're the only one who can do anything about it, because your legislature can't amend your constitution, right? Uh, we put these in our constitution and only we can change it if we, if we want to change anything. Uh, it's also important to note that all three of these fiscal policies that we put in our constitution over the last 35 years were well intended. Uh, Coloradans don't vote against their own self-interest, not intentionally. Uh, and, uh, and so there was good reason to put these in the constitution, but because they're in the constitution they don't change over time. Uh, and we live in a dynamic world and times change and that has created some unintended consequences because we can't foresee the future when we put these amendments in the Constitution uh, and because we've overlaid these amendments with each other they interact in ways that we never could have anticipated when we first adopted the Gallagher Amendment in 1982 and our message to Colorado thought leaders is not that we need to change these policies we don't need to change them they're they're largely working as they were intended 
Our message to Colorado thought leaders is just be aware of how they're affecting your quality of life because if you can look at a 35 year trend chart, you can see that we have not been able to sustain our quality of life over the last 35 years. Uh, and it's quite likely we won't be able to sustain our current quality of life over the next 35 years. And so as Coloradans, we're all faced with the, the same two choices. We either, we either need to change our expectation of what we want our quality of life to be and be realistic about that, uh, or we need to change the three fiscal policies that are driving that quality of life. Uh, and we are agnostic on the, the, the choice as to what Coloradans want to do. Uh, we're just to, here to explain the situation and to, and to listen to people's uh, feedback. Uh, what we don't want is for Coloradans to wake up in 20 years and say, gee, what, what happened? Because if you, can, if you can draw a straight line and look at a 35-year trend chart, uh, you can not only see where we come from, you can likely see where we're headed. Uh, and, and maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. We leave that up to you to decide. So uh, we're going to talk about two of these three amendments today, the Gallagher Amendment and Tabor Amendment. And, and we'll engage you in some uh, feedback with these clickers to get your response, and then we'll hopefully have some time for some questions at the end. So what is the Gallagher Amendment? Uh, the Gallagher Amendment, to understand Gallagher Amendment, you have to understand what property taxes are, because it's all about property taxes. Property taxes are assessed locally. Uh, they're collected locally, they're spent locally. The state does not have a property tax. We have not had a state property tax since 1964. The state gets no benefit from property taxes. Property taxes pay entirely for local services. And you can see fully, uh, half, is that a train whistle? That is pretty train, cool. Train, uh, train ringer. That's a pretty cool uh, ringtone. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you see, fully half of all local property taxes that are collected are, uh, are uh, uh, used for K-12 education. So they pay for the local share of K-12 education. Primary use of property taxes, but fully a fourth of property taxes pays for all things county. So county administration, county roads, county sheriff, all things county. And then 20% of property taxes pays for special districts, fire district, ambulance districts, the emergency services district, library district. Uh, cities get a very small slice of property tax, but city's primary revenue source is sales tax. So that's property tax. You also need to understand how property tax is, is calculated. It's a very simple two-step formula. Uh, your property tax bill is simply a function of the assessed value of your property. So think of your house. Uh, whatever the assessed value of your house is, which is a function of the, the market value, whatever you could sell your house for, times what's called the assessment rate that dictates how much of your property is actually subject to taxation. And uh, we put this in the Constitution in 1982. All property in the state, farmland, skyscrapers, small businesses, vacant land, all property in the state is taxed at 29% of its market value except houses. Houses are on a formula, and they are currently taxed at 7.2% of market value. So you take the market value of your house times the appropriate assessment rate to determine how much the assessed value is, and then you simply multiply that by the mill levy that uh, the voters in your district have approved upon the buyer district and school district and everything else. Uh, each mill that voters approve generates $1 of tax for every $1,000 of assessed value. So let's put some numbers to this so we can kind of see how this works. If you had a $500,000 property, so a house, you had a $500,000 house, well, the Constitution says houses are taxed at 7.2%. So your $500,000 house, uh, $36,000 of that is actually subject to taxation. Uh, and if you live in a 60 mill district, you know, 27 mills to pay for a school district and 15 mills for the fire district or whatever, each mill generates $1 for every $1,000 of assessed value. So 60 times 36. The annual tax bill on your $500,000 house is $2,160. And that pays for that pie chart of services, right? Half of that $2,160 pays for the local share of the school district. A fourth of it pays for all the county services. 20% pays for special districts. So what is Gallagher? Well, Gallagher was part of a package of property tax uh, uh, proposals that your legislature referred to you in 1982. Uh, and in that time, uh, how many of you were here in 1982? Okay. About, okay, over half of us, I think. So you remember in the late 70s, we saw some pretty significant population growth, right? We, uh, Colorado had kind of been discovered as an international ski destination. John Denver was singing our praises and people were moving here. Uh, and uh, uh, that was, uh, at that time, uh, with people moving here, there was 45% uh, of all the property in the state uh, was made up of houses. So, uh, and 55% was everything else. You know, farmland, skyscrapers, business, everything else. And what Gallagher did was Gallagher just said, uh, uh, we should uh, 
we should make, uh, we should just freeze that. That ratio is pretty good ratio, 45% residential. So it froze in time the ratio of residential to non-residential value uh, in the state. So uh, why did your legislature refer Gallagher to you in 1982? Well, uh, all those people that were moving here in the late 70s, uh, we thought that was kind of an anomaly uh, at the time, and it turns out it wasn't an anomaly. Uh, Colorado was actually popular. Uh, except for the oil bust in the 80s, we've seen significant population growth for 40 years. And all those people moving here, uh, his uh, effective real estate prices, not surprisingly. This is a change in market value of residential property in the Denver metro area. Uh, and you can see it goes up and down over time, going back to 1976. Uh, but you can see there was a fairly significant spike in the value of residential property uh, in the late 70s. Uh, and that was causing some consternation amongst homeowners who were calling their legislators, and that is what prompted your legislature to refer the Gallagher Amendment to you to try and stem the growth of property taxes. Uh, so why does that matter? Uh, well, the reason the Gallagher matters is that frozen ratio in the Constitution, 45-55 residential, non-residential, is driving down the assessed value of every house in the state formulaically, and that's eroding the property tax base that pays for all local services. Uh, and here's why that's happening. Because of all the people that have been moving here over the last 40 years, houses now make up 80% of all the value in the state. And 20% is everything else. Skyscrapers, farmland, vacant land, uh, uh, small businesses, 80% uh, is houses. But when you adopted the Gallagher Amendment in 1982, you said that's not possible. Houses can only make up 45%. So how does your legislature make 80% equal 45% to comply with your constitutional mandate? Well, you go back to our formula. If Gallagher says that the total assessed value of all residential property in the state can't be more than 45%, and yet the market value of residential property is outpacing the growth in the value of non-residential property, the only way to maintain the 45% is to simply shrink the assessment rate for houses, the amount of how much each house is taxed. And that's exactly what we've done for 35 years. Uh, prior to the adoption of Gallagher in 1981, 30% of every house was subject to taxation. And Gallagher has formulaically driven that assessment rate on houses down to the point where it's 7.2% today. It can never go to zero formulaically, but it can go to 0 0.00001. <laughs> uh, so uh, here's just some uh, numbers just to show how that works. In 1981, if you had a $300,000 property, a uh, house, 30% uh, of it was subject to taxation. Uh, if you lived in a 60 mil district, which is pretty typical, your tax bill was about $5,400. Uh, now, if you own a $300,000 house, and I'm, I'm uh, adjusting for inflation just to keep the math simple, but if you inflate the cost of the services and the value of the house, you, you arrive at the same ratio. Uh, but keep the math simple, if you had a $300,000 property today, own our house, only 7.2% is subject to taxation, so your tax bill in the same 60 mil district is now under $1,300. It's about a fourth of what you paid 35 years ago, and that's happening on every house in the state, which is eroding the tax base to pay for all those local services in that chart. Second reason that Gallagher matters is that that, that forced 35-year erosion in the residential assessment rate is quite unintentionally impacting the, the poorest communities in the state more than, more than the, I think, rural communities, more than the metropolitan, more affluential communities, and, and here's why that's happening. If Gallagher's formula says in any given year that the residential assessment rate has to drop 10%, which is not untypical, it's 7.2% today, three years ago it was at 7.96, so it's not untypical for it to, to drop 10%. So Gallagher says it has to drop 10% to maintain that 45-55 ratio, but if you live in a place uh, called Jefferson County or, or uh, Douglas County or anywhere in the metro area, or pretty much anywhere along the front range, uh, not only, even though you may be seeing a reduction in the assessed value of each house, which is eroding the property tax base, you're probably seeing a, a growth in the market value of the houses themselves, which kind of mitigates that impact. So the metro area doesn't, doesn't see that erosion as quickly. But if you live in a place called Alamosa, or Craig, or Sterling, or pretty much anywhere that's not near a ski area in the front range, not only are you seeing that formulaic erosion of how much each house is taxed, you may be seeing uh, an erosion, a decrease in the actual market value of the house itself, which compounds the erosion of the tax base. This map shows uh, kind of where that's happening. This is change in market value of residential property between 2014 and 15. 
It says 16 to 70, but for property tax purposes, values are calculated two years in arrears. So this actually reflects change in value from 14 to 15. And you can see between 2014 and 15, the only place in the state that saw an increase in residential market value was the, the North Front Range. Uh, the dark gray areas saw up to a 5% decrease in market value of residential property. The light gray areas saw up to a 10% decrease. And the most rural and remote areas of the state in the white saw more than a 10% decrease in the value of market, market value of residential property on top of the 10% decrease in how much of each house is taxed. So over time, rural communities see that erosion of their property tax base much faster uh, than do metropolitan communities. The third reason Gallagher matters is that the way that local taxing jurisdictions respond to this forced formulaic erosion of the residential assessment rate is they go to their voters and they say, we need to raise the middle levy. Uh, we're not trying to increase your taxes. Uh, we just want to stabilize the funding for the fire district. And even though you're going to be paying on more mills, you're paying a lower assessment rate, which is formulaically going down. So it won't cost you anything. And, it, it, and oftentimes, it doesn't cost homeowners anything. It's a wash. Uh, and oftentimes homeowners vote for that. So they raise the mill levy to sustain the fire district. But remember that every other class of property is taxed at a fixed rate of 29%. So think of small businesses here. Every time we vote to raise the mill levy just to stay, sustain the same funding level for the fire district, that's a real tax increase for every other class of property. So every time we raise the mill levy, it may be a wash for homeowners and their residential property tax, but it's an actual tax increase for business owners. Uh, in 1981, before we adopted Gallagher, for every dollar that homeowners paid in property tax, businesses paid $1.40. Uh, last year, for every dollar that homeowners paid, businesses paid $4. So that shift has been happening over the last three decades, and it will continue to happen as long as people move to Colorado and residential values rise faster than non-residential values, uh, which is not great for, for our uh, economy. Uh, fourth reason that Gallagher matters is 10 years after we adopted the Gallagher Amendment in 1982, we adopted the Tabor Amendment in 1992. And Tabor interacts with Gallagher in a couple ways, which uh, we did not intend when we adopted Gallagher. Uh, number one is Gallagher was originally intended uh, to maintain that 45-55 ratio between residential and non-residential. Uh, the intent was that when, if we ever saw residential values rise faster than non-residential, then the assessment rate on houses formulaically had to go down just to sustain that 45-55 ratio. But the intent was supposed to work the other way, too, that if non-residential values actually grew faster than residential values, then the assessment rate on houses was formulaically supposed to go up. Okay? Uh, but when we adopted Tabor 10 years later, Tabor says it can never go up without a statewide vote of the people, which we've never had. And that's why when we look at this chart that we looked at earlier, for 35 years it's never gone up uh, because we've never had a statewide vote of the people. Uh, this flat line between 2004 and 2015 that was during the oil and gas boom of the early 2000s. And during that time, non-residential values in the state actually did rise faster than residential values. And had Gallagher worked as it was intended, the residential assessment rate would have formulaically ticked up during that time. But because it takes a statewide vote of the people to do that, all it could do was flatline until residential values started to outpace non-residential values again. And now we're formulaically stair-stepping down again. Tabor has a similar impact on the mill levy. Uh, but prior to adopting Tabor, the way local taxing jurisdictions could deal with the forced erosion of the residential assess rate is they could automatically raise local mill levies without voter approval just enough to sustain a constant funding stream. So lower tax rate, more mills, <coughs> constant revenue stream to fund the fire district. But when we adopted Tabor, Tabor says it can't go up uh, unless there's a vote of the people. And that's why taxing jurisdictions locally have to keep going back to the voters and say we need to raise the mill levy again uh, because the assessment rate continues to go down. Uh, that works well in some communities, uh, but it doesn't work so well in communities like Lamar. Uh, they have a very small uh, commercial tax base, uh, primarily agriculture tax base. Uh, they are kind of maxed out, and to the extent they raise their mills anymore, the feed co-op is in jeopardy of going out of business, and it starts to collapse the entire business infrastructure of a small rural community like that. Um, Everything I've shared with you up to this point about Gallagher is local impact, right? These are local taxes for local service. The state has no, uh, uh, no uh, impact in this. But since statehood, uh, there has been a partnership between state and local government to fund K-12. through And that is the largest share of your state budget. It's about 40% of your state budget. It's also the largest share of your local budget. Uh, it has historically been primarily a local funding responsibility 
under local control, paid with local property taxes. But because of this 35-year erosion of the residential assessment rate, uh, local school districts have found themselves increasingly challenged to, to pay for K-12. through And we have another piece of our Constitution that says to the extent that local school districts can't pay for K-12, through the state has a constitutional obligation to step in and, and backfill that. So the state's uh, responsibility in that partnership has grown over time. Uh, in 1989, the state share of that funding partnership for K-12 was 43%. The local share was 57%. Today, uh, 2015, uh, state share was 66%. I think it's 67% now. Uh, local share has shrunk to 34%. Um, the reason that matters is for every dollar that the state has to contribute to backfill local school districts to offset the formulaic erosion of the residential assessment rate, that's one dollar the state doesn't have to pay for everything else that we want the state to pay for, namely transportation infrastructure, uh, higher education, whatever else. Uh, additionally, he who pays the bills makes the rules. Uh, and it used to be that K-12 was a local control issue. Well, now that the state is the two-thirds majority shareholder in that partnership, the state makes more of the rules. And oftentimes that looks like unfunded mandates that your legislature hands down to local school districts, which increases their administrative costs to try and comply with, with the mandates without additional funding. So, uh, I'm going to share with you some potential options, policy options. Uh, all of these grew out of a, an interim committee your legislature explored in 2018. Uh, and then we'll solicit your feedback, but can we kind of walk through? First option I'd like you to consider is the option of doing nothing. And it's important to us to offer that as the first option because uh, BBCO is not advocating for any outcome here. We're not advocating for change. Uh, and, and this is a legitimate option to do nothing. And the very good reason to do nothing is if you own a house, doing nothing almost guarantees that your property tax bill is going to keep going down. Uh, and that's, uh, that means more money in your pocket, right? So who knows better how to spend your money than you? So there is a reason to do nothing. Obviously, the con side of that is that uh, the more that, <laughs> the more that uh, your property taxes go down, the less uh, that we're able to invest to sustain uh, local service and infrastructure. A second policy option would be to repeal that frozen 45-55 ratio out of the Constitution. Repeal Gallagher. Uh, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't raise or lower the assessment rate on houses. It would just stop the formulaic erosion so that it would just flatline at 7.2% forever uh, unless the voters changed it. A third option would be if, if we recognize that the reason that the residential assessment rate has been driven down for 35 years is because residential values have grown so much faster than non-residential, another strategy might be maybe we should redefine what is a residence. Uh, and if we could tax some residences at a higher commercial rate, that would slow the growth of residential value, which would slow the erosion of, uh, of uh, the residential assessment rate. So think of uh, uh, short-term vacation rentals, Airbnb, not workforce housing, but vacation rentals. Uh, was that what we intended when we defined residence in 1982? Or is a short-term vacation rental really more of an income uh, business enterprise? Uh, should it be taxed at a higher rate? If we did that, it would slow the growth of residential value. Uh, same with second homes, third homes, fourth homes. Did we intend every resident someone owned was a residence, or did we intend primary residence? So that would be an option to, to redefine residence. Uh, a fourth option would be to replace the statewide assessment rate that we have today with regional assessment rates and have different assessment rates depending on where you live to stop the growth in market value in one area of the state, like the metro area, from driving down the statewide assessment rate in areas like Alamosa that are not seeing growth in market value. Um, the, the challenge to this option would be wherever you drew the lines, we'd be back to inequity, such as what brought us Gallagher in the first place, because I'd live on one side of the street and 3% of my house is subject to tax, and you're on the other side of the street in another county and 30% of your house is subject to tax. Uh, so uh, this could be done, but it would create some inequity inherently. A fifth idea would be to just leave Gallagher alone, but decouple it from Tabor, uh, so that Tabor doesn't apply to Gallagher and allow Gallagher to work the way it was originally intended, which means that whenever the uh, residential assessment rate went down formulaically, local tax authorities could automatically raise local mill levies without voter approval just enough to sustain a constant funding stream. So if you decouple Tabor and Gallagher, it would restore the ability of local taxing jurisdictions to raise mill levies. So, um, we're going to vote on these options, and um, you have a, let's see, in back of it. You, so with your clicker, you don't need to turn your clicker on, it's already on, uh, 
I will ask you a series to, get to, to uh, give your opinion on each of these five options on a scale of one to five. Do you strongly support it or do you strongly oppose it or whatever? Uh, and all you have to do is press the letter. If there's a row of black keys, uh, you can use that row of black keys or you can use the white keys. There's two A's, two B's, two C's on your, on your keypad. So you can use either one. Just press the letter. You don't need to press enter. Don't need to press return. Just press the letter. It'll appear on your screen. And then you know your vote's registered. If you change your mind, just press a different button. Uh, it will only record the last entry that you made. Uh, if you feel real strongly about one of the options, just press that button several times. It won't do anything, but it'll make you feel better. So it'll only record the last entry. Uh, if, the, if the letter that you're pressing doesn't appear on your screen, just raise your hand and I'll come around and reset that for you. So here's the first option. Um, how do you feel about the option of doing nothing with Gallagher? Should we just leave Gallagher alone, the way it works? Um, and you can see up here, there's, uh, this counts how many people have voted. So you can see we're registering. But if yours isn't registering, raise your hand and I'll come around and help you with it. Uh, a, do you strongly support doing nothing with Gallagher? Leave it alone. Uh, B, slightly support. C, neutral or no opinion. D, slightly opposed doing nothing. Or E, strongly opposed doing nothing. Do you think we need to do something different? I'm going to give you about five more seconds to register a vote for this, and we'll close this in three, two, one. How do we feel about doing nothing with Gallagher? Well, today, 40% uh, of the people in the room today strongly oppose doing nothing, and another 20% slightly oppose. So 60% of the people in the room uh, think we should do something different. So here's uh, statewide in our conversation with 1,800 uh, people in 37 communities. Um, pretty strong opinion, agreeing uh, with, with those of you today, 86% uh, of people uh, that we engaged said we need to do something different. So here's the first something different we offered for your consideration. Should we repeal Gallagher from the Constitution? Uh, it wouldn't raise or lower the residential assessment rate. It would just stop the formulaic erosion, and so it would just flatline at 7.2% forever unless the voters decided to change it. How do you feel about repealing Gallagher? A, do you strongly support that? E, strongly oppose, or something in between. I'm going to give you about five seconds here to register a vote for that. Close this in three, two, one. How do we feel about repealing Gallagher? Uh, pretty good support for that. 30% uh, strongly support that, 33% slightly, so 66% support that. Uh, statewide uh, was equally supported, about 72% statewide supported that option. Uh, the next option. Should we redefine what is a residence? Uh, what is residential property? And maybe tax uh, short-term Airbnb vacation rentals at a higher rate, uh, or maybe second, third homes. Uh, different ways you could do that. But should we redefine what is a residence and tax some residential property at a higher rate? How do you feel about that? A, strongly support, E, strongly oppose, or something in between? I'm gonna close this in three, two, one. And uh, very strong support for that. 61% strongly support that, another 24% slightly. So 85% of the people in the room support that. 9% um, of you apparently own vacation rentals. <laughs> <laughs> Coloradans don't vote against their own self-interest. Uh, OK, so that idea statewide wasn't quite as popular, 63%, uh, 64% statewide. A fourth idea would be, should we replace the statewide assessment rate? Yes, ma'am. Okay, when, uh, let, me, uh, let me help you with that in just a second. Uh, so should we replace the statewide assessment rate with regional assessment rates? Draw some boundaries and have different assessment rates for different regions. Uh, and then there would be some inequities, obviously, from region to region. So how, do you, how do you feel about that idea? Okay, I'm going to close this in three, two, one. How do we feel about replacing the statewide assessment rate? Eh, not much support for that. That's pretty even. 42% uh, uh, support that and 45% no. Okay, uh, statewide, that similarly it was kind of in the middle. Uh, not even a majority support for it statewide. And the last idea, uh, should we just uncouple Tabor and Gallagher? Uh, allow, uh, again, allow local taxing jurisdictions to automatically raise the middle levy without voter approval, just enough to offset the formulaic erosion of the assessment rate whenever it goes down. How do you feel about that? A, strongly support, E, strongly oppose, or something in between? 
close this in three, two, one. How do we feel about that? And pretty strong support for that. 32% uh, both for strongly supported and slightly, so 64% support that. So there's about three options there that we had uh, almost two thirds or more consensus uh, on that. Uh, statewide, that idea was equally strongly supported, about 72%. So this kind of surprised us uh, to see almost three quarters statewide uh, support for a couple of those options. Because uh, we, don't, we don't see that in the traditional political arena, that kind of agreement. Uh, we each, the reason we use these clickers is they're completely anonymous, which is really critical to getting honest feedback. Uh, people will vote very differently in a room with their peers uh, if you ask them to raise their hand. Right? They first look around and say, who's here? Who's watching me? Uh, so the clickers are essential. Uh, uh, so we don't know how anybody voted, but in our community meetings, we ask demographic questions. You know, are you, which, you know, are you a Democrat, Republican, your age, your gender, your business profession? Um, so we can, we can align the clickers with those demographics. So even though we don't know who voted which way, we know which way business voted versus people who aren't with business. And so we looked at that cross tab here. Does, do, do people who affiliate with business look at this any differently than people who don't affiliate with business? And, and not really, uh, which kind of surprised us. Uh, and it kind of reassured us that when people kind of look at the issue through the lens of, of Colorado as opposed to their own personal narrative, um, we tend to agree more than we disagree. So that was, that was encouraging. So let's switch gears here and talk about Tabor, and then we're going to wrap this up. Uh, what is Tabor? Tabor was adopted. You adopted that in 1992, 10 years after Gallagher. Tabor does a number of things. It prohibits an increase uh, in taxes by local or state authorities without a vote of the people. Uh, it also limits the amount of revenue the state and local governments can collect. Uh, at the state level, the state budget is allowed to grow only as fast as population plus inflation. Uh, Locally, we're only talking about state policy in this conversation, but it's worth noting that locally, most voters have removed this cap uh, for, for city and county governments and special districts uh, entirely or at least partially, uh, which means that city and counties still have to get a vote of the people to raise a tax, but once the tax is approved, uh, cities and counties are allowed to use every dollar that that tax generates. They don't have to refund money back. The state doesn't have that. state still has a revenue limit at the rate of inflation population, and any time we go over that, we have to refund that. Um, Tabor does some other things, too, that are kind of technical in nature. 99% of Tabor is these first two, and those are the two that we're going we're to talk about. Uh, so what is, how has Tabor impacted Colorado? Well, number one, Tabor has helped keep Colorado's tax burden relatively low. Uh, this chart shows the uh, the relative share of, that uh, uh, state budgets have of their state economy. So on average nationally, uh, state budgets represent about 95 to 11% of state economies. Uh, Colorado is fully three to four points below that, seven to eight and a half percent. Our budget represents seven to eight and a half percent of our economy. Uh, we are 39th highest. We have the 39th highest state tax rate, which means there are 11 states uh, that have a, a lower tax rate than we do. Uh, 38 states have a higher state tax rate. Uh, we're 35th highest when you combine local and state. Look at the total tax burden. There's 15 states that have a lower total tax burden and 34 that have a higher tax burden. So uh, Tabor is largely responsible for helping us have a low tax burden. Uh, second thing that Tabor does is over time, Tabor shrinks the size of our state budget relative to the economy. Uh, the state budget grows. It grows at the rate of inflation plus population, but the economy grows faster than that. And so over time, the state budget's share of the economy is, is smaller and smaller. Uh, back in 1993, after we adopted Tabor, the state budget was 4% of the economy. Today, it's about 3.5%, and it's kind of being forced down because of that formula in the Constitution. Uh, and the reason that it's shrinking is, is pretty simple. This uh, chart shows revenue to the state over time, going back to when we adopted Tabor in 92. And you can see right away, we're a growth state, right? The economy's growing, people are moving here, we, we're growing. Uh, but we've had our recessions in 2002 through four, and 2008 through 10, we've had recessions. Here's the Tabor revenue limit that says the state budget can grow as fast as inflation plus population. And anytime we grow over that, collect more money than that in a, in a booming economy, such as in the late 90s, that has to be refunded back to the taxpayer. In 2005, after the 2002-03 recession, uh, your legislature could kind of look down the road at what the economy was expected to do, and here's the old revenue limit. Uh, and the state was going to have to, uh, was going to be in a position where they would have to refund back about 20% of the state budget. Uh, and that would have meant we would have had to close colleges, which really would have impacted rural communities more so than, we wouldn't have closed CU. Uh, 
So uh, the legislature referred referendum C to the voters in 2005 uh, that still kept the inflation population revenue limit, but it changed the base year. It just raised that limit up, which prevented all of this money from being refunded. Okay, but we're still growing through it, you can see. So you can see every time we have a growth period in the late 90s, early 2000s, presently, economy grows roughly the same rate of speed. Uh, and here's the Tabor revenue limit before Ref C and after Ref C. And hopefully you can see that the economy grows faster than the state budget is allowed to grow. And the reason is because the state budget is allowed to grow as fast as inflation. The economy grows as fast as inflation plus productivity. Economy grows based on business efficiencies too. So the economy always grows faster than the state budget is allowed to grow per Tabor. So over time, even though the state budget's growing, uh, it represents a smaller and smaller share of the economy. The third way impact, uh, Tabor impacts is that Tabor's revenue limit of population inflation doesn't keep up with the cost of the services we expect state to pay for. And here's why. Uh, Tabor says we can grow the budget as fast as population, but it's agnostic in terms of what that population looks like. Well, in Colorado, the fastest segment of our population, fastest growing segment, is the 65 and over crowd. Up until uh, 2005, about one in 10 Coloradans was a senior. Uh, we started seeing a fairly significant increase in the aging of our population uh, because of all the ski bums that moved here in the 70s and never left, and now they want health care. Uh, and uh, this is not expected to level off till 2050. So we have another 30 years of this, and by that time, one in five Coloradans will be a senior. Double the percent of our population as it was in 2005. Fastest uh, growing demographic of our state, and in terms of the state budget, it's the most expensive to serve. Uh, even though seniors only make up 6% of the total Medicaid population, they consume 20% of the cost of Medicaid because of long-term care. So fastest growing demographic, most expensive to serve. Uh, Tabor says your budget can grow as fast as population, and hopefully it's not an aging population like Colorado's is, more so than most states. Uh, Tabor says your budget can also grow as fast as inflation, which sounds like a good idea. Uh, looking back to over the last uh, 35 years since we adopted Tabor, 30 years, uh, the inflation rate CPI has grown 66% uh, for tires, toasters, consumer products. Uh, during that same time, uh, education costs, including higher ed, have grown 187%, medical care 124%, prescription drugs 98%, transportation 72%. Point being that just about every expense that we expect the state to pay for, whether it's health care costs for our aging senior population or concrete and asphalt for roads or salaries and pensions for parole officers or school teachers, just about every cost that we expect the state to pay for rises at a rate faster than the price of toasters and tires and the consumer price index. And yet Tabor only allows the state budget to grow as fast as inflation. So neither Tabor's inflation or population limit allow the state budget to keep up with the cost of services we expect or the population that the state is expected to serve. And because Tabor's population inflation limit doesn't keep up with the cost, it's forcing your state legislature to cut some programs just to uh, meet mandated funding requirements for other programs. This is your total state budget, 100% of your state budget going back to 1994. These are the four largest program areas consistently. Uh, by far and away, the largest program area in your state budget is K-12 funding, about 40% of your state budget. Uh, the state can't cut K-12. We have a funding mandate we adopted in 2000, Amendment 23, that says state has to grow funding for K-12 at the rate of student enrollment plus inflation. Uh, this blue line is human services, the brown line at the bottom is corrections. Those two are caseload driven. State can't really cut those. We have so many inmates. Uh, we're not going to close a prison to balance the state budget. Uh, we have so many disabled uh, individuals, so many vulnerable children. It's just caseload driven. It is what it is. Uh, the one that's growing, uh, as you can see, is health care. And it's been growing for 30 years because of our aging population, right? It's, it's directly related to that. Some people have said, well, is that the Medicaid expansion in 2010? No, it's been growing for longer than that. Uh, the Medicaid expansion actually wasn't even paid for with the state budget. The Medicaid expansion was paid for with a 10% fee the hospitals charge, which drew down a 90% federal match. So if we got rid of the entire Medicaid expansion population, we'd lose the 10% hospital prior fee and the 90% federal match, and your state budget would remain unaffected. So this growth in healthcare is simply an aging population uh, that is gonna continue for another 30 years. So uh, those four largest programs in 1994 consumed 70% of your state budget, which left 30% available to pay for everything else, namely transportation and uh, higher ed. Uh, in 2016-17, uh, those four areas consumed 80% of the state budget, which left 20% to pay for everything else, 
things, namely transportation and higher ed. Over time, uh, that amount of discretionary money available in that white space is shrinking because Tabor doesn't allow the budget to grow as fast as the cost of the four major programs that are largely mandated. Uh, so it's kind of squeezing these other programs out, and that's why over the last 20 years, the state has cut funding for higher ed by half since 2000. State used to pay for 68% support for in-state college tuition. Uh, today, the state pays 35%. So the burden has shifted to students who used to pay 32% and now pay 65%, which means students are graduating with more debt uh, and are therefore less uh, able to purchase a home when they graduate, which doesn't, doesn't help the economy. Uh, that is why the state hasn't kept up with transportation funding, because higher ed and transportation live in that shrinking discretionary white space. Uh, and since 1991, Colorado's population has grown 64%. Uh, the amount of vehicle miles traveled by that growing population has grown 82%. And yet the capacity, total lane miles, to support that growing population has only grown 2%. So if you feel like there's more people on the road, you're not crazy. You might be crazy, but you're not wrong. Uh, so here's some Tabor options. First option is, should we do nothing with Tabor? Uh, you can't vote on these yet. We'll, we'll please, I just want to walk through them. Uh, so do nothing with Tabor. And the reason to do nothing is it will help to ensure that Colorado has a relatively low tax burden. Uh, and uh, it will ensure that the state budget doesn't grow relative to the economy. In fact, it will ensure that it shrinks relative to the economy. Uh, a second option would be to uh, decouple Tabor and Gallagher. This is the same option that was in your Gallagher bucket that we just voted on. Decouple and allow Gallagher to work the way it was intended. The reason we put it in the Tabor bucket, too, is the primary benefit of decoupling Tabor and Gallagher would be for local communities, because it would help stabilize the local tax base. But to the extent we can stabilize local tax base, it slows the required backfill of the state to support K-12, through which leads to more money in the state budget to pay for transportation and higher ed. So we, we include that option here. A third option would be to keep the revenue limit, but modify it, change it so it's not based on, in, on inflation, base it on the growth of the economy which grows at the rate of inflation plus productivity, grows faster. Uh, that would ensure that the state budget doesn't shrink relative to the economy over time. It would stay the same size relative to the economy in good years and bad years. Okay. A fourth option would be just to eliminate the revenue cap. Keep the requirement that the state has to ask voters to, to raise a tax, uh, but, but uh, uh, it, once a tax is approved, allow the state to use every dollar that's generated. Get rid of refunds. This is, again, this is what most uh, voters have allowed cities and counties to do. A fifth option would be, should we restore some ability of your elected legislature to actually raise your taxes without your approval? Uh, and there's different ways you could do that. Uh, this is, you, know, you could give them carte blanche authority to, to set the tax rate as they saw fit, which is the way we did it for the, the first 120 years of statehood. Or you could, you could require a supermajority vote of the Senate and the House, and if they reach that threshold, then they could raise tax. Or you could uh, limit you know, up to a certain amount any given year. There's different ways you could do it. But kind of the question is, is there under any circumstance would you allow your state legislature to raise taxes without voter approval? OK, so we're going to use our clickers again. We're going to solicit your opinion on these ideas. Uh, the first option uh, is the option of doing nothing. Uh, should we just leave Tabor alone as it is? Do you strongly support doing nothing? Uh, slightly support doing nothing. B, uh, C, neutral or no opinion. D, slightly opposed doing nothing. Or E, strongly opposed doing nothing. Do you think we need to do something? Okay, I'm going to close this in three, two, and one. How do we feel about doing nothing with Tabor? Uh, well, that's even a stronger opinion there. 57% strongly opposed doing nothing, 16% slightly opposed. So 73%. Is there a teacher in the room? <laughs> feel free to correct my math. I think it's 73%. So first, uh, statewide, similarly, 87% statewide said, yeah, we've got to do something different. Uh, so the second option uh, uh, is, uh, should we just decouple Tabor and Gallagher? Again, this was the same option that was in your Gallagher bucket. Uh, keep Tabor, keep Gallagher, but decouple them so that local taxing authorities can automatically raise local mill levies without voter approval uh, whenever the residential assessment rate declines. Uh, just enough to offset that decline in the assessment rate. Uh, that would slow the backfill requirement of the state as schools uh, become challenged to fund uh, K-12 locally. How do we feel about decoupling Tabor and Gallagher? I'm going to close this in three, two, one. And pretty strong support for that. 33% strongly support it, 38% uh, slightly, so 71% support that. Um, statewide, uh, not quite as much support, 59% uh, uh, statewide. Um, 
Should we, a third option, should we keep the revenue cap but modify it based it on the growth of the economy instead of inflation? Uh, because the services we expect the state to pay for grows at a faster rate and that would help ensure the state budget doesn't shrink relative to the economy over time. How do you feel about that? I'm going to close this in three, two, one. And very strong support for that. 43% slight, strongly supported, 43% slightly supported. So 80, 86% support that. Uh, statewide, that similarly was strongly supported. 83% statewide supported that. Um, fourth option, should we just eliminate the revenue limit? Keep the requirement that the state has to ask voters to raise a tax, but once a tax is approved, allow the state to keep every dollar that tax generates in good years and bad years and get rid of refunds. Uh, how do you feel about that idea? Get rid of the revenue cap. I'm going to close this in three, two, one. And not as much support, but pretty strong support. 43% strongly support it, 22% uh, slightly, so 65% uh, support that. Uh, statewide, um, that was uh, uh, pretty strongly supported, 83% supported eliminating the revenue cap or modifying it. Uh, and the last option was should we restore some ability of your elected legislature to actually raise your taxes without voter approval? Uh, there, <laughs> don't laugh. This is supposed to be a serious option. <laughs> so, uh, how do you feel about that? I'm going to close this in three, two, and one. <laughs> now you can laugh. Uh, but we were in Trinidad, uh, Senator Larry Crowder, who's just a great guy, uh, was there. And uh, uh, it looked about like this on that slide. They, it was like nobody supported restoring the bill to legislature raise taxes. And Larry, as soon as the slide popped up, Larry goes, I, I just want to show I voted against that too. <laughs> Man after his job. So, okay, so that wasn't very popular, and statewide it was not very popular. So, uh, Colorado just liked the ability to approve taxes. Um, we had an organic option that we did not offer as part of our statewide conversation, but it was offered organically by audiences in about a third of our communities, and that was should we just get rid of all of Tabor? So, I want to ask them what you think of that. Get rid of the, the revenue limit, get rid of the requirement that voters approve taxes, get rid of all of it. How do you feel about getting rid of all of Tabor? I'm going to close this in three, two, and one. And not surprisingly, because it would get rid of the requirement that voters approve taxes, there's not as much support for that. There's uh, uh, opposition to 43% strongly opposed, 19% slightly, so 62% uh, oppose that. Uh, statewide, there was support for it, but, uh, but not hugely enthusiastic, about 63%. Uh, so here's a kind of a dig deep question, digger deep question. Uh, if, uh, uh, which one of these applies to you? Uh, do you not support the legislature's ability to raise taxes at all uh, in any way, uh, or would you support it if there was a supermajority requirement of both the House and the Senate? Or would you support it if it was up to a limited amount that you would set in any given year? Uh, or should we just give them the authority that they once had to uh, set taxes? Which one of those four applies to you? I'm going to close this in three, two, and one. And not surprisingly, not supporting it. Uh, if it was, it would be a supermajority. Uh, statewide, there was more support for the idea of allowing the legislature. Uh, the supermajority votes vote statewide was most supported. So I'm going to flip through this next one uh, because uh, we are running out of time. Um, we asked people statewide, uh, if, you, if there was money in, uh, to invest in, in the program area and you were in the state legislature and you had these uh, uh, five choices, where, what would your be, be your priority? Uh, education uh, was number one, transportation was number two, mental health was number three, economic development number four, and senior care number five. So that's, that's statewide. And the reason we ask that, there is a, a measure on your ballot this fall called Proposition CC. Uh, we framed these options up uh, in July of last year, in 2018, and it, much to our surprise, your legislature in May of this year referred one of those ideas to your ballot as Proposition CC. And it's the idea of, of uh, eliminating the revenue cap entirely uh, and, and then dedicating any monies that otherwise would have been refunded, dedicating it to education and transportation. Uh, so here's a couple of uh, final slides. Uh, we did the cross tab on this to see is there any difference in opinion in, based on your political affiliation on these same options we just voted on. And there are differences, 
uh, as you would expect, but not as much as we expected. The options that were most popular for Republicans in the red were the options that were most popular for Democrats in the blue. Uh, the idea of eliminating the revenue cap, 67% of Republicans statewide supported that. Uh, the idea of, of modifying the revenue cap, 80% uh, of both Democrats and Republicans support that. Uh, and this last one, uh, we took a sampling of two of the Gallagher options, two of the Tabor options, and then two Amendment 23 options that we didn't talk about today. And we looked at three communities that lean left, Aurora, Boulder, and Pueblo, three communities that lean right, Colorado Springs, Grand Junction, and Greeley, to see is there a difference based on your zip code. And, and again, there are differences, but there's no pattern. In some communities, the ones that lean right supported it more, and in other communities, the ones that lean left supported it more. Uh, the only, uh, there, there, there really, I mean, there was, there was a couple of outliers like here, but in general, it, it just didn't impact it based on the zip code. Uh, and so our takeaway from all of this is that if you are thoughtful about engaging constructive thought leaders in a conversation based on the facts, and you, and you look at the issue through the shared lens of the state that we love, and not a political ideology or an organizational agenda, but you look at it just through what do we want our state to be, and you engage in a constructive dialogue and you empower the audience to drive the outcome, they'll agree more than they disagree. And that was really encouraging uh, for us to see that, because we don't see that in the traditional political process, and we don't hear it reported on in the legislature. Uh, and so, uh, not sure where we go with this, but, but the results were, were interesting. Here's uh, all the slides that I've shared with you are on our website, uh, betterco.org, and there's more information on there about Amendment 23 and marijuana revenues and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, and I have my email address up here too, if you'd like to reach out. And I've used up all our time, but I'd be happy to take questions if we can. That was great. I, I think it's fascinating. We really, I mean, maybe we have time for one question, um, depending on how long the question, if it's a real short, succinct question, and there's a short, succinct answer. Otherwise, I'd say, <laughs> Um, if you've got to talk about a detail, maybe you can approach Reeves afterwards and ask him. Okay. Um, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much for your time. So fascinating. <laughs> Our program for next week, Judy Ann, you have put together a public land. I'll let Judy Ann tell you what's on tap for next week. Thank you, Barbara. Next week. You pass your clickers into the middle. Next week, we'll have representatives from us, Forest Service and BLM, here to talk about the Public Lands Information Center, which is, I think, a, an unknown gym here in our community that we don't know about. It's where you can go to get everywhere from a firewood cutting permit to a map giving you how to get to a trail. So they're going to be here next week to talk to about that collaboration between Forest Service and BLM and how it affects all of us as users. So thank you, see you next week.